Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased that you could all come. And I want to say on behalf of the Center for Industrial Ecology and the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering that Paul Anastas and I are so pleased to host our wonderful colleague, Bill McDonough. We honor him as an absolute pioneer in the realm of sustainable design. And we're also glad to introduce Bill to our current students. So you too can see the arc of sustainable design and what it means to question the status quo on many issues, such as just how green a building uh, should a person build, and then build goes out and builds one that's way more green. And these kinds of things are what uh, I, I think that the world finds so inspiring. I remember another key phrase of Bill's where he talks about, you can't just be less bad every year. You can't just gradually reduce your organization's environmental harms because that won't get us to the place where we want our planet to be. There's not nearly enough time to introduce Bill formally as the awards alone would fill my allotted four minutes, but here are two bookends. Bill's treatise in 1992 with colleague Michael Braumgart, the Hanover principles that laid out sustainable design principles to the world. And on the other end of that arc last year, Fortune Magazine named Bill one of the world's 50 greatest leaders. No more adjectives, not green leader or sustainable leader, but world leader. So I wanted to offer a less formal, slightly more personal introduction about this Yale Architecture School graduate who spent his earliest years in Tokyo and Hong Kong. The personal part, Bill, is the special opportunity I have to thank someone I met more than 20 years ago and how that helped to shape my thoughts. Bill's publication, The Next Industrial Revolution, appeared in the Atlantic Monthly in 1998 when I was just getting to really rev up my teaching and my research. And I got to see how a real artist and leader could rethink so much that there are two kinds of materials that said simply are quite different, biological nutrients and technical nutrients, and the metabolism of each should be kept apart that there was a great degree of difference between striving for efficiency versus striving for effectiveness. And I remember a late night in Pennsylvania when I heard Bill say, celebrate abundance for the first time. I was shocked and delighted and all these years uh, wanted to hear more. So I didn't know this was possible to meet up with an old friend online, but this summer I was getting ready to speak at the G20 meeting when I spotted Bill on WebEx where as a keynoter, he had just presented one of his recent new ideas, the circular carbon economy, which he'll mention. I was eager to have Bill back at Yale upon seeing him. And indeed, he served on the leadership council for what used to be known as the forestry school. Now, of course, the school of the environment for 14 years, and we reconnected. There was a short, there was short notice in putting this together because I urged Bill to come before the semester break that starts tomorrow as I wanted him to inspire all of us, and especially the industrial ecology class, as we take off for the cold waves ahead. So Bill, I turn this over to you. Thank you, Marion. You can hear me clearly? Very much. Here we go. I'm going to talk about waging peace through commerce by design. I was born in Tokyo in 1951. And my mother is one of the first American civilians in Japan after the war. Both my parents spoke Japanese. My father was a first lieutenant in the occupation army. And MacArthur had trained 200 young American couples in language law and custom of Japan to invade Japan after they signed the treaty in Tokyo Harbor. My parents were one of those couples. They went in First, without uniforms, without weapons, without paperwork, and unmarked jeeps. Speaking Japanese and taking baths, waging peace. We had dropped the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs. The surrender was absolute. It was time to wage peace. So for my first five years, I was a child there living in a Japanese traditional house, paper house. And every night we would listen to the farmers come on the cobblestones with their ox carts 
to collect our sewage. And my mother would come in because the children fall, you know, woken up, the babies, and we would lie there on our little futons, and she would sing us songs in her Alabama accent, American folk song tunes in Japanese, making up words about the honey wagons and the night soil, and that the farmers would go to the farms and bring us our food. And you're three years old, and your mother is singing you poop songs in the middle of the night, and you're in heaven. So I'm still there. I think the cities and the farms are all one thing. Waste equals food. So I became a designer and I think that design is the first signal of human intention. We wake up in the morning, we have designs on the world. So we're inherently optimistic, one would hope, because we want the world to be better. So that's what it means to be a designer. I'm coming to you today from Shawsville, Virginia, where I had the privilege of being the Dean of the University of Virginia School of Architecture and living in this house on the lower left corner, Pavilion 9 on Thomas Jefferson's lawn. And I show it here because when you look at what he was doing here architecturally, he's expressing something very important, which is uh, what he called an academical village. And oops, I have to go back. Um, an academical village. Now notice he's using academical. Um, Plato had an academy. Aristotle had the Lyceum. So when we look at the rotunda at the head of the lawn, what we see is Plato. Platonic forms, spheres, cubes, pyramids, triangles. And, and this is the search for values, the right, the wrong, the good, the bad, the ethical, the unethical the beautiful, the ugly. This is search for truth and beauty, really, and meaning. And then the 10 pavilions on the sides are Aristotle. It's decimal. And Aristotle called what he did practical wisdom. He was Plato's student. So if you have the wisdom of the right thing to do, then the question is, how do we do it? So he called it practical wisdom. How do you execute once you have that wisdom? And so that is science and number. So truth in value. So when you put these together, you find that there's this astonishing potential to think about values as humans that drive to value. And that's where commerce comes in. But if we start with values, we have to move to principles, to visions, to goals, strategies, tactics, metrics, value. But what we find is so many people are working on the left side here, which is quantification. So they start with value. They say, here's the business. Then they do metrics, strategies, tactics, and then their goals are set as benchmarking. And that's all you can get to is benchmarking. I'm gonna be 20% less bad than this thing or something more, make more profit than that thing. And it's goals based on statistical significance. Whereas if you start with your values, what's the right, and the wrong thing to do, you're starting with qualification, not quantification. You start with quality. Then you move to principles, visions, goals, strategies, tactics, metrics, and show the value. And that is the power of commerce as an engine of change when it moves from beyond just simple numerical statistical significance into meaning and culture. So what are my values? When I started as an iron project, this is the question I ask. How do we love all the children of all species for all time? Then we start to lift our pencils. We start to dream and we start to move. So our job is to make the world better because we're here by design, not worse. So I like to start my thinking with this poem, I work with lots of poets, by the way. This is Hildegard von Bingen from 1124, a Catholic nun, doctor, mystic poet. Glance at the sun, see the moon and the stars, gaze at the beauty of her screenings. Now, think. These are all seeing 
verbs. What a delight God gives to humankind of all these things. This is to be celebrated. But then this one, all nature is at the disposal of humankind. We are to work with it, for without it, we cannot survive. This is the concept known as usufruct. It is here for our use. And when we think about it, Emerson in 1838 was asked by Harvard to write an essay on nature. And the question they posed was, if humans are natural, are therefore all things done by humans part of nature? And when he concluded in his essay, he said, nature is all those things that are essentially ineffable, unchangeable essences, he called them. The oceans, the mountains, the leaves, the air. Welcome to the Anthropocene. So much for the first industrial revolution. The oceans were too big to affect. The air was too big to affect, and here we are. So if you're designing something new, and I'm a designer, so I want to reflect back on one, one thing Carl Sagan said, which is if you wish to make a pie from scratch, first you must create the universe. So think big and, and try and figure out where we are here. So since I got to see Hiroshima when I was five, started with a Life magazine picture at my parents' house, and I started crying, and I didn't know why people would do this to each other. I also didn't know, how is it possible to make cities disappear in seconds? So when I finally got to college, I went to Dartmouth. I said, now I get my questions answered. So I studied international relations and Ramon de Ron, peace and war, detente theory, and realized it's all about mutual assured destruction and it's misery. So I decided that's not for me. And then I took physics because I wanted to not be not scientifically minded, but I, I want to take physics just to understand how a city can disappear in seconds. And the professor handed me the special theory of relativity and said, you want to know, you have to read this, solve that equation, e equals mc squared. And I went back to my dormitory, totally depressed, because here I thought I'd be a Yosin ambassador someday or something. And, you know, I grew up in Japan, Hong Kong, mostly in Canada. And then, you know, here we are, it's, it's mutually assured destruction. Here's the city disappearing. And I can't do this formula, you know. Finally in college, I mean, Ivy League school, just like you are, and I can't do this. Very frustrating. So I put e equals MC squared all over my dorm room and I stared at it. And then finally, I was watching a fire burning down in our dormitory, this is New Hampshire, surrounded by trees. And, and I thought, well, this is entropy. This is chaos. This is what everything is. They're all going to chaos and it's a law of physics. So, you know, I'm in a world going to chaos and politics and relationships. And, among people, some things, it's really depressing. So I went to the library looking for negative entropy. I couldn't find it. And enthalpy, exergy, all kinds of stuff with E, but I never found negative entropy. So I went back to the dorm and I sit, sat there staring at the embers and all of a sudden it occurred to me, the log was negative entropy. The log is an aggregation of distributed dispersed energy from the sun carbon from the atmosphere, minerals from the ground, water, and so on. Life was negative entropy. We are order out of chaos ourselves. So, so then I realized that I could think about the world as energy from the sun, uh, materials are here already, rock of some water, and then combining the sun with the carbon from the atmosphere, we get biology. And that is growth. And that is humus. And isn't it amazing the word human derives from the word humus. We are the soil people. And when we go beyond that, we hear the word humility, which just comes from humus. And it means to be grounded. So the talk I'm giving today is about being grounded. So first we have to have our principles once we express our value statement. So as Marian mentioned, in 1992, I wrote the Hanover Principles. They became the gift of Germany to the Earth Summit in 1992. And those nine principles, which are fleshed out in a book, um, 
are, are still the fulcrum upon which I le lean my levers of change. Because when you go to change the world, as Archimedes said, give me a fulcrum, a lever, and a place to stand, and I could raise the earth. He was recently misquoted in a very important newspaper as give me a lever and a place to stand, and I could raise the earth. They forgot the fulcrum. Without the fulcrum, you can poke it and you can push it off a cliff, but you're not going to lift it. So we need things that we hold to be true. And on those, we will lean these levers of change. And so these are the nine principles I use when I'm designing. Am I accepting responsibility for consequences of design? Have I eliminated the concept of waste? This is minimize, avoid, reduce. Eliminate the entire concept. Rely on natural energy flows and so on. So from there, we move on to visions. And obviously, Mr. Jefferson had a vision of education. He had a vision of a country and so on and so forth with all the complexities of being human at a very place in time. We have visions. And so that's where I work, by the way. I've been called a professional visionary, which is kind of fun. So when, you, when I went to the Earth Summit, when I represented the design community, the United States and European, and international design communities. Um, I brought this with me and I said, you're gonna be looking at, at equity economy, the social and market economies we've had, and now we're gonna add the environment. But if we see the social markets as socialism and we see the capital markets as capitalism, then these are extremisms and they're not good for the environment, as we can tell. The former USSR had been declared 16% um, uninhabitable. 1992, they called it ecocide. And, and the economy, you know, the, the capitalists will cut down the trees and forget the fish. Um, so just worrying about money. So if we just do society, we just do money, we forget the environment, that could be a problem, but it could be just as big a problem if we only worry about the environment and we don't worry about people and we don't worry about the economy. So the power of this idea is not just a Venn diagram. It actually breaks down like a fractal into tiny elements and decisions that all contribute to the health of the whole. And this came because I was looking at Francis Crick after realizing that Einstein's equal mc squared was E energy, right, and then M mass, fine. And then, wait a minute, how do you solve that equation? Well, all I can do is say, well, C is the variable, is the constant, it's the fulcrum, it's constant. So let's start your formula by looking at the constant. And it's a big number, 186,000 miles a second. Uh, and then it's really huge, too big for me to even imagine. And then if it's not big enough, we'll square it. So E equals MC squared. That means M is the atom, one atom, hydrogen. And E is the bomb. There it is. But what's missing? Biology, life. So. Then I looked into biology and I, I started looking at Francis Crick and James Watson discovering DNA. And how did they do that? How did they find 16 <laughs> points and electronic microscope space and then realize they're connected in a double helix with an invisible hydrogen bond? What kind of person can do that? So I looked into it. And after nine years later, J Crick gave a, a lecture at the University of Washington called The Molecules and Men. And in it, he looked for what he called the nature of vitalism. What does it mean to be a living thing? And his conclusion was to be alive, you have to have growth. Wow, think about that, otherwise you're dying. And to have growth, you have to have income, of course. And most of nature uses solar energy. And then you have to have an open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organisms and their reproduction. Bang, an open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organisms and its reproduction. So I decided to draw this because this is an open metabolism of relationships that is operating for the benefit of the organisms and their reproduction. Because we can start with the economy, as a lot of people do, and just say, are you making money? That's the lower right corner. Are you paying people a living wage? That's the red one. Are you doing eco-efficiency and things like that to damage the economy, the ecology as little as possible while you do your business? Then we can go to the equity question and say, the red one would be, you know, fairness, it's dignity, grace, respect, it's sexism, racism, 
And then you have the blue one, are men and women paid the same for the same work? And the green one would be, is it safe? Is it fair? Just put somebody in a toxic office or expose them to toxic products. And then environment, we can say in the red corner, is, is it fair to leave future generations with a damaged planet, perhaps even toxic, toxify? And the green one would be, am I following the laws of nature? As an architect, I follow the law of gravity. It's not just a good idea, that's a law. And then the blue one, we call eco-effectiveness. Am I doing business profitably while following the laws of nature? That is important. That is waging peace through commerce by design. And that's what this whole thing is. So I'm now developing this into an ESG tool um, for people to use to help analyze their companies. Now, it's important to realize that this whole issue of circular economy, and, and you know, for whatever reason, they call me the father of circular economy at the World Economic Forum, but it's just the economy. And so it's just that lower right corner. So you have corporate social responsibility, of eco efficiency, of financial profit. And this is now known as the triple bottom line. But the bottom line is for managers to leave some profit behind. It's man managing and minimizing risk, and it's producing profit. That's fine. But what I'm excited about is what I call the triple top line. And this is for executives. See, a manager's job is to be efficient and do something the right way. But the executive's job is to be effective and do the right thing. Then give it to the managers to do the right way. Plato first, Aristotle second. So I find this to be a very useful tool as I work with CEOs. And there it is, 100% fabulous. Can you imagine checking all those little triangles? And it goes another level. So it's really, it's all very interesting. So from there, we can go to goals from these visions. And so here's how we do our goals. My goal, as Marion pointed out, is not to be less bad. You see, less bad is a strange thing to say to a child. We don't say, go out there and be less bad today. It's ridiculous. And being less bad is not being good. By definition, you're bad, just less so. So the good and bad are Plato, the less and more are Aristotle, right? So, so I like to be more good. And so my goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, water, soil, power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed. There, straightforward. Because being less bad is not being good. See, if I go out to be less bad, it sounds like this. I'd like a less unsafe, less unhealthy, less unjust world, less monotonous, less polluted air, soil, water, and power, economically driven. There it is. You'd be amazed how many people in business, this is really how you could articulate what they're trying to do, is to be less bad. Now, when you see these charts and everybody says, oh, I'm gonna be less bad, and my goal is zero, I worry a little bit when I hear everybody's, my goal is zero. Because you're telling some of your goal is nothing. And tell your children, my goal is nothing, and you, you know, I have to, it may be difficult to have to feed and clothe you. And uh, if you just say, I'm gonna reduce my carbon emissions by 20% by whenever, you're telling us what you're not going to do. It's like telling a taxi driver, quick, I'm not going to the airport. Is this really helpful? You know, maybe a point of interest, but it's not that useful really. So for executives, no, they don't spend their time telling people what not to do. Let's take what we don't want and put it below the line. And let's take what we do want put it above the line. And then let's do an inventory of all our choices. Let's put it through an intellectual filter between the 100% fabulous and the 100% terrible and locate everything on it and then get rid of the red and increase the, the green and off to the races. And we're doing constant improvement and the world's getting better every day. So that's what we do. So from there, we develop stat strategies, tactics, metrics that relate to whatever field we're working in. I work in architecture, I work in chemistry, I work in uh, city planning, I work in product design. Right now we're doing packaging. Can't wait to show you what we're doing there. But as you notice from the Hildegard speech, the first order of business here is to change the way you see. So humans apparently see that flower that way on the left, but a honeybee and a butterfly see what's on the right. Isn't that something? So let's change the way we see. Glance at the sun, see the moon and the stars, gaze at the beauty of Earth's green. So 
I was in a, a daycare center because so I was designing a, ne ne a negative entropy building in Frankfurt, Germany. Daycare center could be operated by children through food and provided hot water for the parents to laundry to wait for the kids. And they get operate shutters and open close windows all day and do all their stuff. And while they are, uh, they, the engineers were arguing that you couldn't have children operate a building, I was just staring at the kids and there was, they were eating furniture. So I, while they're arguing, I just looked at these kids and said, I gotta find out what's in everything they're chewing on here. And, um, and then I could overhear the teachers say to the engineers, we don't think you understand our problem. Our hardest job is to find things for children to do. How about wake up the building in the morning? Close the shades if it's getting hot. Put the building to bed at night. That's what we have to have. And our children are not brain dead. So what do we see? For a lot of people, when they see this, we're doing a lot in fashion these days. And you see a gown, you see a cap, you see shoes, fine. But what does an ecotoxicologist see? And obviously, uh, Paul Anastas is with us, who's one of the great heroes in the space of green chemistry. This is what we see. That is what we see. Now, once you see something like that, what do you do with it? Well, and why are we worrying about it? Oh, goodness. Can you imagine saying to somebody, I'm going to design for you an object that I would like you to put in, in intimate contact with your largest organ, your skin, and expose you to persistent materials, bioaccumulative substances, endocrine disruption, cancer, genetic mutation, and reproductive toxicity. Hope you like it. It's blue. Really? So let's think about that. So how can something be beautiful if it damages children's health or destroys the environment? How do we love all the children of all species for all time? So this is cradle to cradle design. This is what we try to do. So we see the world as being biological nutrients. Like Crick was describing one thing's waste, there's another thing's food. These things actually get consumed. And then we have technical materials that provide utility and services over time. What we want is to watch the television, not ownership of all these chemicals. So we call them products as a service. And it's phenomenal how this evolves and becomes the circular economy, obviously. But it, the most important thing is that it really takes these two things and lets us engage in propitious ways. So the fundamental rules in Cradle to Cradle are waste equals food, use current solar income, and respect diversity. So it's really quite fun. And this is where you know, uh, we can look at the upcycle, which is about the next, the coda, what next, everything is food. Use clean energy and celebrate it. A nice thing here is that Vintage Classics in London decided to publish five books that changed the way we see the world. And they put cradle to cradle next on the origin of species. Thought that was fun. So what we're talking about is designing for an economy, goods and services. And we also have goods as services, the product as a service concept. But it's important to see the word goods because if we end up with a circular economy of bads, and then we do it again, we're making bads and services. And then we're doing it again. So circular isn't good. It just means again. So cradle to cradle is designed for use, not end of life. And next use without the end of life. Now end of life, life cycle assessment is a very precise scientific thing, as you well know. Uh, and it, it really matters because it's about source to ultimate disposition. And it has to be accurate. But in the middle of all that, there's the cradle to cradle. You take these sources and you do things with them. And then we're saying design it so when it's done with its use, it's ready to move on somewhere the, uh, propitious rather than just go, oh, it goes to landfill, check the box, end of life. Yeah, that's a human projection on an inanimate object. So that's fine. It is a defined system. But this is design. And this is taking products and designing them for next use. Welcome to the circular economy. So we developed a, a protocol and a certification system. Here it is. And the five criteria are material health, safe, and biology and technology, of course. Circular economy, notice it's second, because first it has to be safe. So safe, then circular. And that's for material realization and continuous assets. This is sharing economy, shared economy, circular economy, regenerative economy. 
So then we have renewable energy, of course, just like a tree, and with clean water and, and social fairness. So we now got the certification program. So, uh, I created it, put it in an independent third party, uh, fund, funded it with, with wonderful donors from, from um, uh, the Dutch and Wendy Schmidt and, and got it up and running and here it is. And it's now in the public domain, third party independent peer review. So Cradle to Cradle is about quality. The circular economy is a piece of it, but it's about the quantity, which means doing it again. So we move from a linear economy of take, make, waste to a circular economy of retake, remake, restore, regenerate. So, so much fun. And AB and AMRO, the Dutch bank, did a little history of the circular economy in their research. And they found that they saw it when we started in China. Uh, I started in 1999 in China with us. And the Chinese published Cradle to Cradle as the design of the circular economy. And then developed the five year plan, 12 five year plan, promote the circular economy, later the 13th five year plan, implement it. We introduced it to the World Economic Forum. Then we introduced it to Ellen MacArthur. She's taken it in many places. The Netherlands has adopted it. It's really exciting. So here's that little short version of the history. As it comes along, you can see uh, on the lower left, you see Ellen MacArthur's sketch based on our system. But even still to this day, we see these people drawing these donuts and say, you know, the, the linear, it's the circular economy is a linear economy, a circle. No, it's two circles, biological, technical, like how we like to look at it. If you do it that way, then it works at every scale, every scale from the molecule to the planet. And what it is, is the search for the good. We're searching for good material. We're searching for a good economy. We're looking at good energy, good water, and good lives. So if you take those five approaches to everything, you realize they're all fundamental and foundational to all 17 sustainable development goals. So our clients with these companies that are going towards sustainable development goals, they need all five as a starting point. It's a fulcrum for all the work. It's beautiful. It's something they all share. So good materials. So right now I'm designing packaging. I'm showing you one of my favorites. Uh, this is a box designed to be, go right back to your soil safely, cardboard box, and I call it the mulch box. Um, and we're doing packaging and, uh, for e-commerce and all kinds of things. Um, we're doing small form formats, we're doing sachets. It's a big, big project we're about to start with Unilever. And so here's a design of a building. When NASA asked me to work on Mars, space station, I said, can we come back to the blue planet first before we go to the red one? And so we used the same scientists and we designed a building on Earth. This building can make 140% of the energy it requires from renewables, purify its own water using forward osmosis, and, uh, and is designed with cradle cradle materials so they can all go back to, oops, excuse me, they can all go back to Alcoa, they can go back to window makers, they can go back to the window shade makers. So it's circular economy, credit card certified materials for NASA. It was done for a normal federal office building budget ahead of schedule. It has now been considered the highest performing building in the federal government. Normal budget, normal schedule. We've been working in clothing. I'm very proud of these jeans. And one of the parts that really excites me other than that's all about, it's all organic cotton. Even the threads are organic cotton, the dyes and mordants are all selected for ecological human health. The factory doesn't release water. It only releases water by evaporation, if you can imagine. Uh, it's renewably powered, solar and wind. So these genes to me are just this exquisite ephemera. And, but look, it's mass market pricing. That's 28 euros retail. Everybody can have this. This should be democratic. So working with the world's largest personal care company, L'Oreal, we've been working on their products. So they're cradle to cradle platinum material health down to the molecule. So we have transparency uh, on, on these things. You can't say, oh, we can't give you our fragrance transparency. And that's what we did with Michelle Pfeiffer. These are unisex perfumes for her children. This is fine fragrance. This is uh, cradle to cradle platinum. Her son is Henry, her daughter is Rose. So what is a good economy? Well, it would be circular sharing and share. So here's, oops, excuse me. This is the 
carpet we designed with Shaw Industries. They were number five in the carpet tile sector. Now they're the largest company in the world, uh, carpet company in the world. So we redesigned it with them to make it a thermoplastic polyolefin back with a, a now in six phase that can be chemically recycled. And so basically you're storing all your raw materials on your customer's floors. As an economic model, it's quite astonishing. So it was bought by Berkshire Hathaway and I'm very proud of it. Um, product as a service, so washing machine, you want clean clothes. Why do you, you don't want metal and glass and wires and all the rest of it. So basically you can think about these things as services and we can make good quality appliances and then come back and, and replace them when we're ready, but we have all the materials and we know where they are. So Philips is now doing this lighting based on our concept. So you buy, you get the light in this building you're seeing here. We're not paying, we don't own the fixtures, the light fixtures, they all belong to Philips. We just pay for the light. So the building is designed to be converted to housing in the future too. So it wants to change its use and store its carbon. Here's a little project at the Davos, which I built on top of a men's clothing store and a beauty parlor. It's a little meeting room uh, outside the, the Congress Center. And it's made with nanotechnology, critical certified aerogels. Uh, and it's really as if Buckminster Fuller went to bed dreaming of domes, but woke up with a right angle. Um, so we can build it in a day and a half. And it's a fabulous room for meeting and it's warm. The walls are an inch thick, but have the equivalent insulation of eight inches of foam. So it's sort of magical, like a paper house. Here's taking that notion of the, that frame and putting it on a very simple, inexpensive building to give it color and light in Bogota. This is a school for small, medium enterprises to be trained in cradle to cradle for young Colombians coming. There are 18,000 students learning cradle to cradle for business in the future. So what is good energy? It's clean and renewable. Here's a project we did for Unilever. This is a building that can make more energy than it needs to operate from uh, solar. These are solar collectors that rotate their own north, north south axis and, um, and they rotate in the morning into the afternoon. They do 30% more energy that way. But it also means we can farm under them. So we grow food too. YouTube's headquarters. Um, this is, we did originally for the gap and it's now it's being tripled in size for YouTube. Ancient meadows, these are the ancient grasses in this place. We had to get permission from the federal government to go collect them. And I wrote an article in Nature in November uh, 2016, right before Marrakesh, which was entitled, Carbon is Not the Enemy. And I always love this picture that Nature picked for it. A lot of people go, oh, look at this Beijing, what a mess. And then you go, wait a minute, that's Vancouver. That's the conference center. That's the green roof. And that's a fog. It's not a horrifying story. This is actually very beautiful. So it's funny, it changed the way we see. So I realized that we were, we were using all these strange words about carbon. We talk about carbon as our enemy. We needed a war on carbon, you know? Carbon is bad. Carbon is not bad, we are carbon. If you wanna be carbon free, zero carbon, you should probably shoot yourself, dry up and blow away. So carbon is to be celebrated. So we have living carbon in the soils, there it is, the sun shines on the earth, carbon from the atmosphere, comes on down, becomes humus. There it is, living carbon. And that's a positive thing, it's a behavior. And then we have durable carbon, which is carbon neutral, which is making things that are recycled, like polymers are using wood beams and buildings for a thousand years and so on. And it's durable carbon. And then we have, uh-oh, fusion of carbon. And we are now releasing atmospheric carbon about 50 gigatons a year. It's a toxin. A toxin can be defined variously, but one way is the wrong dose, wrong material, wrong duration. And this is the wrong amount of carbon dioxide in the wrong place in the atmosphere for a long, long duration, forever. Whoops. So that we got to deal with. It's a toxin. And, and just removing a little bit or doing an offset, if you can imagine. Imagine you're talking about lead. Can you imagine telling children in Flint, Michigan, don't worry, kids, we've done a lead offset for you. We took lead out of the water in Austin, Texas, equal to your lead. Now you're going to be lead neutral. What? They're not brain dead. Uh-oh. So then we've got fugitive durable carbon, which would be plastics in the ocean. So now we can talk about the carbon with some 
dignity and grace, living, durable, fugitive. Now we can start designing this way. So I propose a carbon positive city in China and do it up. So here's cradle to cradle writ large as a city and how to manage the carbon flows. That's what it looked like. 128 kilometers of territory to feed and clothe and provide clean water to 100,000 people. Good water, clean and available to human right. Every child should have fresh water all the time, of course. So this is the first textile we did in 1995, worked a Swiss mill and we designed something, we changed the chemistry with 8,000 chemicals and got it down to 38. And by the time we finished, the water coming out of the mill was as clean as Swiss drinking water. And so the business is still in Switzerland. It is now the preferred fabric for airplane seating. So say if you can eat it. We also look at waste management things with water. This is Vancouver, where they found just trying to get the pipes not to calcify, they uh, aren't to mineralize. They, they put it in a vortex to see what happened. And it came out as phosphate pearls around magnesium cores. It's fertilizer and produces about a 12% return selling it to farmers instead of polluting the water. At Ford Motor, I uh, redid the River Rouge, Bill Ford, and we said, why don't we try to do the world's biggest green roof? And everybody thought it was a bit loopy because you know, the roofing company says it's impossible. But we said, talk to the botanist. And we found a botanist in East Germany in Dresden who had developed a camouflage for MiG fighter jets during the Cold War. So it's very lightweight. It's made of Mediterranean sedum and um, it was affordable. And there it is. The killer eggs you see there were the birds landed within five days. But to get it approved at the board level, Instead of saying, well, we've added costs, you're building this green roof, it's like silly. No, we said, using this green roof in our landscape, we're going to save you from having to build three chemical treatment plants to meet the Clean Water Act and all the pipes that go with it. We'll let the landscape and the building itself purify the water. We saved $35 million. It was $48 million for chemical treatment and pipes. It was $13 million for this. They saved $35 million day one in capital cost. Think of that. And with the Ford Taurus coming out of Chicago at a 4% margin, this is the same as walking into the board of directors and saying, I'd like to offer you an order for $900 million worth of cars. Approved, next. This is how you get it done, commerce. So good lives are safe, created, dignified. This is Herman Miller factory where all the work factory workers are on the right, the office on the left, and they all live on the same boulevard. They all eat the same food, use the same toilets, the same training rooms, and they're all talking to each other. And it works great. It was built before LEED existed, so they LEED gave a retroactive LEED award. Um, this is what they make in there. And so we decided after the factory, they said, well, what else do you want to build? And I said, I'd like to work on your furniture. And I said, we don't hire architects to design chairs. I said, I don't want to design a chair. I want to do all your furniture. So we created the Credit Trail Certified Program. Herman Miller was a pioneer. We designed for disassembly, all the materials have been assessed. This is for a motorcycle company in India, largest now. And we put all the structure on the roof so we can use it again if we ever need to. And we use the diagonal braces of the pair of trusses to put on solar collectors. So now we have a thousand people working inside. We also have a chance for 450 of the family members to work on the roof and grow food for the families. So I just want to finish this story of Dr. Vint Kataswamy in Madurai, India, because he, he was a cataract surgeon and he, he took this idea of mass production. And he said, why is cataract surgery $1,950? And these older people who can't see I can do it in 10 minutes. All I need is a cubic meter sterility, one nurse, one scalpel, and two visits, one eye each visit. And we can get this done. Why is it $1,900? And the lenses were $250 each from the medical companies and they wouldn't reduce their prices. So he decided, well, if I give it away for free, maybe I'll get a critical mass where I can build my own factory, get the lens prices down. When Dr. V died about five years ago, he had seven hospitals, and he had given eyesight to 3 million people for free. If you could afford it, you paid what was needed to run all the hospitals. 
that turned out to be $50 instead of $1,900. If you want to give a donation, go ahead. But there it is, the tools to change the question of commerce itself from the question we have today, which is how much can I get for how little I give? Think of that. That's the question of modern commerce. How much can I get for how little I give? When what was he asking? He had a different question. Such a beautiful question. How much can we give for all that we get in a world of abundance of goodwill and intelligence and good intentions? This is value creation. And so for us now with the cradle to cradle, look at this, isn't this something? Walmart encourages cradle to cradle. And that got you know big uh, personal care companies moving. Walgreens and Boots, the drugstores, going for cradle to cradle. Home Depot, going for cradle to cradle. It's in all the building systems. It's the highest level of certification for products. It's in EPA, it's in cities are calling for it. European countries are calling for it now. But this is fun, this is two or three weeks ago. Amazon announced that they wanted to, of place people could buy the best products in the world, they would have to be certified. So they looked at 8,900 certifications for products around the world. And in March, I got a call from the head of products there. So I'm just letting you know, we just got our, our AI and our machine learning and all deep data mining back in, 8,900 product certifications. I just want to call and let you know, Cradle to Cradle came back number one. Isn't it cool? So when you talk about being commercial, people would always say, oh, I don't know what Cradle to Cradle is, never heard of it, or whatever. See, now you've heard of it. So commerce here can drive a new standard because people around the world will want to be in that zone. And if they don't have regulations in their own country, that meet this, they're going to want to do these regulations. So it's like retail regulations being led by commerce. And these standards that are voluntary can become policy and then they can become regulation. That's how this works. And it's going to take all of us to do it. And it's going to take forever. But that is the point. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was quite an experience. We're very grateful that you um, we're able to share so much with us in such a short time. But you're not done yet. We do have some questions and answers. Well, we, we have some questions. I hope you have some answers. Um, and I'd like to uh, start with one of the many questions that's already come in, Bill. And they sort of are on the, along the lines of, how do you do that? How do you do that magic? But I'm going to let them rip. <laughs> so here goes. Um, I'd like to start with a question from Marie, who teaches a biomimicry class at Arizona State University. And she asks students to look across a system and find leverage points that would change the system, not just make it less bad. Over six years of teaching, students have not been able to come up with more than less bad solutions. What can we do to encourage larger thinking by future engineers? Yeah, that's an existential problem. Um, I think the first thing is famously, engineers say things like the devil's in the details. So you end up, the thing is about devils and you end up benchmarking against, you know, worry, your worries. And I think one of the important things and one of the joys of being an architect is that we like to talk about God is in the details, you know? So it's like, okay, let's go for that. And in all events, details matter. But I think the important thing at the beginning is the, is the joy of creative design. This is like Kirk was saying, it, it's a creative act and it's a co-creative act. So you have to open yourself to the fact you're about to be creative. You're not just doing statistical significance. You're looking for meaning and you're looking for the values. So I think I'm on the, the sustainability board at ASU and it's an astonishing program there. And we're so lucky to have Michael Crow in the world. And we're so lucky to have professors like you there. So you're gonna get there, but think of it as a creative act and, and think about the principles 
and then hopefully we can give you the tools. We have 60,000 chemicals database for human ecological health span. These are going to be available to everybody. So just be brave. Be brave. <laughs> okay, be brave. Uh, Marie, uh, I'd like to call on my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Paul Anastas, uh, the head of our green chemistry program, to ask a question. Paul, you're on. Well, thank you so much. And I just have to say, uh, Bill, on behalf of everyone, thanks so much for that talk, because even though we're, we're living in the Zoom era, I could hear the thunderous applause as you concluded uh, out there uh, in the ether. I, I know that um, I, I've been so lucky to have you as a colleague for 25 years. Uh, and I can guarantee that time we were in China together were the first time the words the circular economy was presented 25, uh, close to 25 years ago. But, well, I could ask about the, your, your vision and the brilliance of the, the conceptual frameworks that you present. I want to ask something a little bit different. For everyone who understands what you're saying, who understands and shares your vision, they are going to need to persuade someone. You are, to me, the most persuasive person speaking on sustainability in the world today. I want to understand how you do it. I want everybody on this meeting to understand how you do it because can we study how you persuade since every one of us is going to have to multiply that and be as persuasive if we're going to bring about the kind of vision and the kind of substance that you outlined. I think, I think a lot of people have a, an affinity to beauty. And I think being able to talk about that and to be able to talk about love unabashedly and then very quickly go to the numbers and verify what you're talking about. This was immensely practical. It is a merger of memory and experience. And I think people have a, a really good sense when you combine those two things, but you see history and experience are two different things. And so when you speak from experience, I think people appreciate that. Because you're, these are real things I'm showing you. This isn't theory. There is theory, but it's the theories and and to to em, embolden the experience, the making of things. So I think people find that very beautiful when they realize they can do. This I don't see too. two M in your contacts. So sorry. Who do you? Apple's talking. Um, the uh, I think that's really part of it. I think the fact that I'm a designer. And I have a place to stand, you know. So I can, I can, I am an architect. I am, and I have a, uh, I have a degree from Yale. I'm a serious person. I'm a professional. Yeah. At the same time, I'm a dreamer, and I like to talk about children. I like to be a child. And so what I do is actually incredibly childish, because I get to play all the time. I'm playing all the time, and after a while, people go. That looks like more fun than what I'm doing. You know? So our job is to have more fun than everybody and, and, and to really be compelling with what we do. So I just try to speak from experience. But I'm also concerned about moving from what I would consider a kind of timeful mindlessness. And again, it traces back to the, to the, to the bottom. After mid-century, in the last century, we, we dropped the bomb. And I remember going to school in Cleveland for a few months, and we were taught to dive under our desks, you know, really, as if that was going to help. You know? But you know, you see Hiroshima, you're going to dive under your desk, really. But, um, but here we are, these children, and we're being taught that the world might end tomorrow. And so when the world might end tomorrow, you just start, well, it's very handsome to start partying up because it could be all over, right? So 
I think that's what's happened. A lot of people in our culture just started living as if there's no tomorrow. And even what we're talking about here, let's live as if there is a tomorrow. Not only that, let's design into that for intergenerational uh, purposes too. So, you know, when you think about it, an apple is currency, but the orchard is capital. So we don't want to destroy the capital. We want to enjoy the recurrency. So we design for currency and we design for capital. And as you saw with the Ford example, when I can pull it off on a capital level, game on. Nobody can touch us with that. You know? They can't argue about it anymore. I'm saving you $35 million. You want to argue about this? So it, that's really helpful to learn the language of all the different people you're dealing with and be able to speak in their language. Many people want to hear it money. The artists want to hear it as art. You know? So have fun. Go everywhere. Do whatever you want. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I just want to say to the audience that um, well, Bill's willing to stay an extra five minutes or so. I, I, we do have quite a few questions, Bill, and I just want to try to get a couple more in before we lose you. So um, do feel free to stay a little bit longer to the audience if you can. And we're taking the questions in the, key, in the question and answer box. Here's a question from Stein. He says, do you feel the current popularity of the circular economy concept reinforces the adoption of cradle to cradle or threatens to dilute the ambitions of cradle to cradle? Oh, wonderful. Um, I guess the answer to that would be yes. Uh, right, but um, the, I don't think it's an issue. I think it enhances circular um, cradle to cradle because once you realize you're gonna do something circular, well, then you'd want it to be safe. So it, it absolutely enhances credit credit because it's the second condition of credit credit. So we see a lot of that, especially when companies are going, wait a minute, you know, I'm making this and I'm gonna do it again, but is it really the right thing, right? So just remember that if a manager's job is to be efficient, do something the right way, but what if they're doing the wrong thing? And what if they're using Six Sigma perfection? They become perfectly wrong. And so a lot of the people who are out there, you know, when you realize you're about to be perfectly wrong, realize it probably is time for a new look. So that supports credit credit. And then, uh, so it doesn't hurt us or dilute us, it only enhances it. And a circular economy is a really important idea for a lot of people because it's the economy, stupid, which means it's sometimes a stupid economy, but okay. Um, still, it's something everybody can engage with because we all have this to work with. So, we're very supportive of circular economy, obviously, since I was the chair of circular economy for Davos. And um, yeah, it's, I think it's great. It's just they, they, they go together. Thank you, Bill. Um, Gus is thinking about uh, your example of when a different person sees a product, they may see something entirely different in it. So in a discipline like architecture, where many experts have different expertises and no one may be able to see the whole picture of the building. How do you manage these different practitioners so they can contribute uh, according to their expertise? And does the practice change the role of the architect in any way in having to do that? When I became Dean at Virginia, I came down and the first thing the faculty asked me in our first meeting was, you are the Dean. You're coming out of private practice. You are." Uh, you are tenured, um, you're in charge, and um, you're an interdisciplinarian. And what are we meant to tell our students when they see you? And what are we meant to tell our junior faculty? Because you could never be peer reviewed. You're non peer reviewable because you're not a specialist. And so, what are you telling us? Are you telling us that we all have to become interdisciplinarians? in order to do this kind of work? I said, absolutely not. You need to become, we need to become all of us multidisciplinaries. So you don't have to be a zoologist to design a building, but you might need to know you need one if you're gonna be interacting with living creatures. So it's really about multidisciplinary, not it has to be embodied in one person. It's the one person has to know they need other people. And that in order to do this creative work, it's just like nature. Um, 
it's a it's a it's a beautiful metabolism that is creative and alive. So that's what you want to engage with. So when we work on buildings, we're doing we're doing YouTube's headquarters right now. We're doing buildings. Europe, we're about to start another headquarters in Washington, housing. But it's all one thing. And we work with all kinds of specialists, chemicals on the materials, botanists, zoologists, air quality experts, you name it. Yeah, we're just the uh, conductor. So I'm going to give you two more questions, Bill. One is very practical from Caroline, and uh, one I've wondered about. How do you ensure that the building materials, you know, the facade panels and the carpet squares and so forth, will actually be sent back to the manufacturer at the end of life? Ooh, end of life. There is no end of life. But at end of life. End of use. Um, given the longer lifespan of buildings compared to products. So it's the question about... Uh, uh, you know, can we, is there an instruction manual for owners or a shipping cost built in so that we know these things really get returned? These things are all evolving. And, um, you know, when you think about it, when we did those chairs at Herman Miller, they're designed so that all the parts can come apart and you could say, this is rubber, this is, this is um, polypropylene, this is steel, this is one. The odds of that chair, if it ended up in Mexico City in 15 years, getting sent back for this, you know, when it's actually parts that go back into aluminum and polymer, so would be um, the odds would be very low. Make the test, but the systems as we've been evolving over time, we're now developing a patching system that uses blockchain and QR coding and things. So that I want to design patching for life, um, which is really fun. And we just ran the first pilots in the UK with one of the poorest populations in Leeds. And they, it was so great because they were all so excited. They get to join the cradle to cradle circular economy, and they're the they're the people who can afford at least because this isn't for people who can afford fancy stuff. It's for everybody. And then they brought their children to the store, and the children all got to get their package. And it's really something. So um, it's multidisciplinary, and, and it's it's sort of positively engaged. So it's a, it, it will become policy. When you look at Elon Musk, I, I know Elon. And when, when you look at what he did, you start with inspiration. Oh, let's have electric cars. Oh, he's not alone there. Then you go, okay, so why electric? Well, because hydrogen is expensive to make infrastructure. We got electricity, everyone else go there. Oh, I need batteries. I'll go to Panasonic. Computer people figure that out. Okay, we'll go there. So move, move, move. And, and so you go from this insight to a vision. Oh, solar powered world, you know, batteries everywhere, solar collection on roads, cars that are electric. There, let's go there. It says visions. And then from there you do execution. And all of a sudden it's working because it's very, these practical decisions. And when you think about what he just did, I mean, you know, somebody pointed out the other day that the market cap of Tesla is 404 billion. The five other largest car, car companies in the world together are 500 billion. Think of that. So basically, the automotive world just didn't realize you could tape an iPad to your dashboard and get back to work, you know? So, and then rethink it. So, but when you look at all that, he gave away his patents. And people say, wow, that was nice. And what he was doing was creating Tesla as the new standard. Here, you can use this standard. And now, you have the standard. And that's what cradle to cradle is. It creates a new standard. And it's not required. It's not legal. It's just commerce trying to behave like adults. And then you get this thing done where the fabrics are clean enough to eat. And you go, well, if they can do it, why can't someone else do it? And then the policy people can step in and go, wow, if it exists, therefore it is possible. It's like leaving us. So, okay, well, then we can make that policy because it's possible. And now you get the policy people working. And then after 10 years, you have regulations based on it, so it takes time. But that's why I like to work with commerce. And if we can com create commercial standards that are voluntary, and they're this good, and that's why I'm so excited it's on Amazon. It's voluntary, nobody's forcing anybody to do this. It's a beautiful thing, all together now. Okay. So um, Bill, as you can imagine, because you were a student once, um, there were 
um, there's some skepticism about the role of big corporations. And I'd like to maybe end with that because uh, you do have commerce in your title and it seems like a, a, a good, good uh, fair game. Um, and so our questioner asks about Amazon uh, and you mentioned the recent agreement you have with them uh, that the most that, that they could have built the most green and efficient headquarters, but they're continuing to distribute non-environmentally friendly products and perpetuate for con consumption for the sake of consumption. Um, and is this meaningful change or is it greenwashing? So it's a it's a challenging question that I I'm sure you've thought about a lot yourself. Well, I think, I mean, this, we live in that space. When I was working with Ford on a factory, we said, how can you do that? They make trucks. And it was like, okay, well, where am I supposed to be? Um, you know, you start small. So it's a great point. This is very small, what we're talking about. Very small. And there is a whole a world of good to do here. There's just, products are not designed for consumption. They're, they're designed for ephemeral uses, typically. So these are not consumer products. So yeah, the whole system has to change. So we got to start somewhere. And also, I think Bezos, when you look what he's doing, you know, everybody has their own thing that they're passionate about. He just announced he's going to put ten billion dollars of his own money into the climate issues, and that's what that certification is for him. What was nice about Cradle to Cradle because it had materials and economy and water and and social fairness. That's important. I'll, I'll explain that in a second, but, but it had to go 100% renewable power. And he's passionate about the climate and that whole issue. So it's really wonderful that we would say, well, maybe we could try for this. So I think it's small. I, I think it's not, you know, it's not to be dismissed, but it's also not to be saying that anybody's perfect here. Um, the whole system is ready for revamping. So I think every, and I wouldn't, I, I'm just complaining about a walk away would be unfortunate loss of opportunity for people lean in and help where they can. So I think everybody do the best they can to help out and figure out what they can do. Yeah. So the question, I think it, we saw this with the G20. When we started talking about the fact that the climate has to get fixed and we all have to do it together. We're coming from different angles. The Europeans are saying zero emissions by 2015. You know, they don't trust anybody who has oil, which is understandable. And because look at the problems. But on the other hand, we realized everybody did have sign the Paris Agreement. Right? Even though the Americans, you know, two weeks ago weren't in that list, they're going to be back. So we all have the same goal, actually, which is a, a world that are worthy of our children. And so once you have that, the question is no longer what's the matter with you or what's wrong with somebody doing whatever they're doing. It's a good question, of course. But the real question is, how can I help you? How can I help you? So when you think about what we're seeing coming in hydrogen, you know, the Germans are going to go with hydrogen. Well, guess where the cheapest hydrogen is going to come from? Green hydrogen, not blue hydrogen, not gray hydrogen. Green hydrogen, no carbon in sight. It's going to come from the deserts. It's going to come from the Red Sea. It's going to be made in ammonia, and it'll be shipped up to Germany so they can have zero emissions. How about that? And then the question would be, well, why don't you give us an order for $2 billion worth of of hydrogen, or well, we'll make a few cheaper because we have one, you know, two cent kilowatt power here. And that's interesting. So we're doing policy by purchase order. We're not here to argue about these things. We're just, this is business. And is Donald Trump starting to walk out G20 if he mentioned climate change? So we're not, we're talking about business. So here, here's $2 billion for hydrogen. Now, we're going to give you an order for $2 billion worth of electrolyzers. Because they need to collapse in price the way solar did, so we can get it done. So good. You get a $2 billion order to keep your people busy in the River Valley making stuff out of steel. It's powered by hydrogen. Steel loves hydrogen. And then you get the jobs, and then we get the hydrogen to make the hydrogen. And then we move on, and by the end of the century, we're the Saudi Arabia of hydrogen. Why not? I mean, think about that. This is big stuff, and it's critical that we do this. And the only way we're going to do it is if we do it together and just say, stop saying what's wrong with you. I start saying, what can I do to help you? That's it. That's the only question that I think really is meaningful at this point. Everything else is sort of snarky and, and isn't open enough to the real need for the metabolism to support reproduction. 
Well, thanks very much, Bill. That's a great ending. Um, how can I help you? How can we help you? And um, I want to thank everyone. There are lots of unanswered questions. I'm, we're going to save them I don't, uh, and uh, see what we'll save all the lists and we will make the recording available. Um, but most of all, I, I wanted to say to you, Bill, uh, thank you very much for what I knew would be a very inspiring presentation and a lot of food for thought. Uh, we're in a very strange year in 2020 and um, we won't even be seeing each other again until February with the, when the students are, are off for such a long time. And um, so I think this is a, a, a nice gift that you've given us uh, this afternoon. And we thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.